Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see us it's almost packed house. Um, we knew if we had a park ranger, yeah, we'd get everybody. Um, so, question. Who knew that the Wright Brothers Bicycle Shop on 3rd Street in Dayton is part of the National Park Service? Oh, now, come on, be honest. <laughs> you knew? Oh, my gosh. I didn't. <laughs> I just found out. Yeah, I found. Yeah, I found out when uh, Bob Stimple, uh, the retiring um, national park ranger, hit his office there, and that's where we get our planes from. You know, uh, let's see. Let's like question next. Who knew that there was an all-black bicycle regiment in World War II? All right, it's a good thing we have a park ranger to talk to us about that. Okay, you're up. Awesome. Welcome, welcome everybody. My name again is uh, Roger Osorio. I'm a park ranger over at the Charles Young Buffalo Soldiers National Monument. Grateful to be with you all here today, so thank you. And I do know we have a presentation going on um, entitled, It All Started With Bicycle, the story of the 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps. Now, this bicycle corps was put together in like the late 1890s, kind of during that time period before the Spanish-American War. And we're gonna get a little into that history, but I do want to forewarn you all, this isn't just me up here talking. I do have some questions throughout the, throughout the slides, a little more interactive, so we'll all be learning a little bit about each other, but also about what's happening there, and kind of relating to the, to the various questions. Sounds good? Don't be nervous to talk, right? All right, so like most of my programs, I always like to start off with a question to kind of like set the pace. The first question I have for you all is, You have to turn the clicker on. <laughs> what do you remember the most from a long journey? Take a second to take that question in. What do you remember the most from a long journey? Waiting to get there. Waiting to get there, yeah. Yeah. Feel free to raise your hand if you want to share. The tired you are when you get there. Yeah, how tired you are when you get there, yeah, for sure. Screaming the scenery. Kids. Huh? Screaming kids. Oh, the screaming kids, especially when you travel with the little ones, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Where's the roadside rest? Roadside rest, yes, it's in the bathroom. So bathroom breaks that you almost miss, right? <laughs> Got all those things in between. Maybe two more, two more, anyone else? The scenery? The scenery, yes. You remember the scenery, especially when from a long journey, whether you're going by plane, train, automobile, right? Those good movies. But you're traveling around, you're skiing, looking out the window, you're seeing the scenery, even as you, if you're driving, you're focused on the road, but you're seeing the scenery as you, when you stop. Maybe one more, anyone else? Food, sitting too long. Oh, sitting too long and food, oh, food is a good one for sure. I do remember certain places as I've driven cross country myself, I still remember that beautiful burger spot. It was a zombie themed bar in Iowa. I remember because everything was zombie themed, which was very interesting to me because I love horror movies, right? <laughs> but yeah, you remember various things from these long journeys. And you notice how around the room, we all kind of said different answers, right? From experiences with travel with the little ones, Maybe the loud noises, we are traveling from beautiful places, especially across uh, this country. That scenery that's very unique, especially across the United States. But there's also those places where you stop to use the bathroom, to get food, all the various things. And talking about the same thing with travel, we're kind of going to go back in time now. Again, like our time period today is going to be in the 1890s. And what was transportation like in the 1890s? Well, for one, for sure, trains, right? Trains, especially uh, when you have that big... From 1869, that Transcontinental Railroad, that's a big way people travel in mass. Kind of staying close to the train tracks, but you're traveling, as you see, as many people as fit, fit on the trains, you're going all in the same direction, right? Another big piece of transportation in history that happened in the 1890s was boats. We had steamboats. You have all these new kind of way to travel by water, just kind of go up and down rivers. More massive ships, bigger ships, right? We have the now the introduction of iron ships, all these things kind of growing from there. And of course, Common one, horses, horse and buggy. It's a common way people got around. And you could always think about the plus and minuses of each of these travels. For trains, as long as they can take you, take you all the way across this country. But if you want to deviate a little bit, could you? No, not really. You have to stay on the train tracks. If there's no train tracks, trains don't go. Um, and if it did, it's not a bad, it's not a good time. <laughs> For the ships, if the water's too shallow, ships can't go, right? There's still the accidents and lighthouses and all these kind of inventions that are happening during that time to really better navigate the waters, right, with the rising and lowering tides. And for horses, you know, if you ever travel behind a horse for too long, that smell will get to you, right? <laughs> and also, you gotta stop to eat. Who else has to eat? Of course, right? So, 
Another thing that happens around this time period is a boom in the United States, and that is the boom of the bicycle. Bicycles become very popular for modern transportation, especially not the long distances, not cross country necessarily, but to get you from point A to point B in a relatively easy fashion. And they're becoming very fashionable. You have the big bicycles, the small bicycles, those tricycles you see in that photograph there, and they're becoming very popular, especially around the 1890s. We started having people do cross country trips on these bicycles. And here you have a photograph of a gentleman next to a deceased horse. That is horse, uh, skull and bones right there. And he's on a bicycle, because you know what's great about horse travel versus a uh, bicycle travel over horse travel? You don't gotta feed a bike, right? Bike's not gonna pass out and you can't go no further and you have to walk the rest on your own. You can fix a bike. And also too, you have a growth of bicycle clubs. This is a picture from New York City. One of the bicycle court, um, bicycle groups there. In these cities, they're booming with the boom of bicycles. You're forming clubs, right? The bicycle clubs, right? Today, we think about motorcycles, but this is way before that, right? <laughs> You're having these bicycle clubs where people are matching outfits, kind of building that community, that camaraderie at, a, a, at the same time. And with everything else, people like to be competitive. You also have a competition. Bicycle um, races, from the foot races, to the horse races, and now we have a new instrument in which we can race, right? So now you're having a growth of this whole division of athletes, right? But if you're looking at the bicycles for fun and for transportation, who else is looking at the bicycles? Well, the military. <laughs> How can we use this for us, right? And in 1875, we actually had the first ever army bicycle corps in the country, in the world. And that happens over in Italy. They decide with the invention of the bicycle, they decide to have, uh, get their entire regiment with bicycles to kind of do away with the traveling with horses, feeding the horses, all the extra um, stuff you have to bring to make sure they're healthy and good. You can just bring bike parts and fix the bike and keep moving, keep accomplishing missions, right? And you can see they have various setups, and this photograph is from that time period where you see you can set everything up on the bicycle fairly easy while still maintaining the riding of it. Still that added discipline, but learning how to ride this with all your equipment, very similar to if you were to ride a horse with all your equipment, right? With this, you're more in control versus an animal, you get the team, right? With that idea of the bicycle corps in the army being existing over in Europe, well, the United States is looking back and says, it's a great idea. So, at the time, Major General Nelson A. Miles, um, he said this quote very famously, in my opinion, the bicycle will be of great value in military operations, not only for the use of couriers in carrying dispatches, but also for moving bodies of soldiers. Now, by the late 1890s, for the most part, the country is a little more settled. Everyone kind of moved out west, all the forts are kind of already established, um, the Plains War is already at the tail end of it, and everything's kind of more settled down in, in terms of conflicts within the United States and, and our territories. But this is a new avenue where we can quickly deliver messages. Trying to go from Fort um, Stockton over to Fort Davis, still crossing mountain paths, still crossing this long, strenuous road, but doing so in the desert or in a more unhospitable area, yes, you have to maintain your water, but also the water for the horses where there is not much. So this is a new idea where we can instead use this machine to still accomplish the same thing. Now, back to my questions. You know, there'll be tons of questions throughout this presentation. But what makes an opportunity a good one? Take, take that into consideration. What makes an opportunity a good one? When you get an answer, feel free to shout out, raise your hands, yes. A need. A need, that's right. If, it's, if it satisfies a need that you have, that's a good opportunity if you're gonna take advantage of that. Anyone else? Cost efficiency. Cost efficiency, if it's cheaper, right? If it's saving you money, you know, all about that green. <laughs> but if it's saving you time, it's saving you money, saving you efficiency, all those type of things. Maybe one more, anyone else? What makes an opportunity a good one? It works. If it works, if it meets your goals, that's right. If it's gonna accomplish the same thing and it's cheaper, it's more efficient, why not? That's a great idea to have, right? So all these various things kind of make an opportunity a good one, but at the same time, Major General Nelson A. Miles presents this idea to the, to the Army, we should have a bicycle corps. The Army's saying, why? We have horse, we kind of have a pretty good setup, but we're still in the process of solidifying soldiers to do as we see, right? To learn the cavalry, to learn the infantry, to learn these skills as we are still settling and kind of maintaining our uh, cadre of soldiers. So why do we need bicycle corps? Like, I, I'm not seeing, they're not seeing the, the point. But who, someone who did see the point was a man by the name of Lieutenant James A. Moss. Now, James A. Moss um, in 1896 just graduated from, um, from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He was the GOAT of that class. 
Unlike the kids say today, the GOAT didn't mean great things when you're graduating as the GOAT from West Point. <laughs> that means you graduated at the tail bottom of the class. So in West Point, even to this day, you still kind of, kind of pick the outfit you'd want to serve in, whether it be infantry, whether it be cavalry. And he, when you're kind of graduating at the bottom, the choices are kind of made for you. And he's chosen, um, or he's assigned to the 25th Infantry Company L as their second lieutenant. At the same time as history proceeds, he was a huge bicycle enthusiast, right? So he, during his time at West Point, yes, of course he had a bicycle, he enjoyed riding bikes, but now he's assigned to the 25th Infantry. And what was unique about the 25th Infantry versus most of the rest of the army? Well, 25th Infantry were African-American soldiers. This is part of what's nicknamed today as the Buffalo Soldier Regiments. These all black units in the US military, about 20% of the army at this time was African-American. Right? So you have the 9th and 10th Cavalries, and you have the 24th and 25th Infantries. Now, these assignments are, could be a great opportunity, especially if you want to move up in the rank. Oftentimes, they experience hardships to fully satisfy having the officers in their ranks. Many white officers did not want to serve with African-American soldiers, whether it be stigmas or their stereotypes or those ideas and nomenclatures that were happening during that time. They refused to. One famous person who refused to serve in one of these units, uh, uh, George R. Uh, Armstrong, Armstrong Custer. He had the opportunity to be the colonel of, uh, <coughs> one, of the, one of the 9th or 10th Cavalry back when they first formed in 1866. He turned that down and went somewhere else at a lower rank. That was his choice. But the campers had an opportunity if he did want to move up. But at the same time, when you do graduate as the GOAT of West Point, you kind of get assigned to where we need you. We need officers in these units. So he gets assigned to the 25th Infantry. And here you have a photograph of them during that time period. This is more of a relaxed photo, if you can imagine. I love this photo because you get to see them in the Buffalo uniform that were assigned by the Army. And those Buffalo coats to keep them warm. You can imagine how cold it gets in Montana where this photo was taken in Fort Kale. Now, with that opportunity there, he takes advantage and kind of forms two things together. The two things were being a part of the 25th Infantry, sure, I'm here, it's not really my choice, but I'm here. Je Major General Nelson A. Miles is saying, we wanna try out a bicycle corps. You know that exists from the Army reports that he kind of said this out loud. So you know a high-ranking general wants this idea to happen. So you take this opportunity to not only show your leadership, to show that you can command a unit, but command a unit to do something successful that's greater for the greater good of the entire Army. Wouldn't that look great on your resume? So he forms and gets permission from his colonel from the 25th Infantry and forms the 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps. Now, because more or less this is an experiment, they're not given tons of funds. <laughs> they're not given long distances to travel. He's not given in charge of an entire regiment. He is, you know, a second lieutenant. He's the very junior grade officer. And this is also his first truly assignment. But with the permission he gets, he does get to form a small group of about eight soldiers, as well as himself in command. And they form this unit to then travel and test out the efficiency of a bicycle in comparison to a horse. Their first assignment that they go off, um, but before we even get to that, um, kind of dial it back real quick. When faced with a new challenge, how do you prepare yourself? What are some of the things that you do to prepare yourself for a new challenge? Research. Now, research, yeah. So you do those research, for sure. Anyone else? Practice. Practice, yes. And those are two things definitely um, Lieutenant uh, Moss did. He did tons of research into bicycles. He was writing to all the bicycle companies saying, hey, the Army's gonna do this experiment. And if you're that company and the Army's gonna test your bicycle, if it's successful, what is the Army gonna do? Buy it. Buy all your bicycles. So they were, yes, take my bicycle, take this one, take this tire, this is our new model. All those things were happening for the research, right? And even the practice, once those bicycles arrived at, um, in Fort Missoula, Montana, where they were stationed, they were practicing. The soldiers got to practice the bicycles, practice riding around the fort, practice riding around the community. And thankfully, at Fort Missoula, Montana, where the, where the, the 25th Infantry was stationed, they already had bicycles for recreation. So some of them already thankfully knew how to ride a bike, but now they're practicing them more off-roads, where they're gonna be practicing them in more of a realistic of our, of our army use. And I have one more, one more. What, what face with the new challenge, how do you prepare yourself? Hmm? Yeah, plan, plan ahead. Plan for all the if, ands, and buts. If you know it's gonna rain, what do you bring? An umbrella. Yeah. If you know it's gonna be cold, what do you bring? A jacket. <laughs> kind of all those things in between. And if you're in Montana, at any time of the year, what can happen? 
Snow. Snow, that's right. So you have a plan for snow. Ice. So are you going to bring over your short sleeves? Not necessarily, but always bring the long sleeves. You know, bring the wool, bring all those extra things in case of ice, right? So they form this unit. They're practicing around. They're studying. They're planning. He's also planning for food, how much food they're going to carry, where stores are along the way, what cities or um, established towns are already along the way, which way they can resupply for food. Because you're noticing you're on a bicycle. You can only hold so much. So the first trip they do is actually up to Lake McDonald, about 126 miles north of Port Missoula. And you can see, what's this point? Yes, it is. You can see there, uh, that's this one, this one. <laughs> well, you can see from the first port, from Port Missoula, on the, on the left-hand side, you can see the arrows going up to Lake McDonald, about 126 miles. They make it there in three days, um, make it there in about a day and a half, and make it all the way back in three days, right? To prove, yeah, you can take a bicycle 126 miles. The roads getting to Lake McDonald's aren't really established. <laughs> they're kind of camping, they're experiencing rain and mud, and kind of drudging the tires through the mud and muck, right? And how to get the mud off the tire, because if it gets hard, you know, we have mud houses, right? <laughs> Those things are becoming very um, damaging to the bicycles. And their second experiment, um, their second test that summer, is actually a well bigger one. This one's about two weeks. And they take the bicycles and they do a bicycle trip from Fort Missoula, Montana, all the way down, you can see it on the bottom right hand side, Yellowstone National Park. And when they ride through that park, they're you know, taking in sight of the animals, the wildlife, the mountains. <laughs> the realities that you're experiencing went in more of a wilderness. Since 1872, Yellowstone National Park was established, it was set to be protected, kind of staying as is. Granted, there are amenities, there's roads, there's things that are being built so, so people can visit and experience what belongs to them as a national park, but not necessarily for bicycles. So they're testing something new. They're trying over all these um, um, challenges. They're going through the rivers, carrying the bicycles over their head, trying to make sure they have enough food and planning all this stuff out. And as they journey along um, into Yellowstone, one thing that happens especially are the road conditions. Like we said, for Montana, any time it can snow, and snow means wet, wet means dirt, dirt means <coughs> wet, right? And you can imagine, these are actual photographs from their trip to Yellowstone. They actually took this time to have some photographers going through them for this larger trip. And you can see the group with Lieutenant James A. Moss in the front on the bottom, mm -hmm. right? And as you see, they're going up and around mountains, you know? Yeah. Go to Yellowstone today, please don't do this, stay on the trails. But <laughs> back when these trails didn't exist, when this knowledge of these places didn't fully know as we know them today, these are challenges that the Army would face. Imagine when they're back in the 1860s, 1870s, as they're moving west, going through Texas and Arizona for the first time, they don't know where the water is. They don't know what roads are gonna collapse or what dirt's gonna be quicksandy or things like that. They're experiencing this not only as soldiers, but with bicycles. They don't have the horse and that luxury to something else to travel. There they're using their human power to move these machines. And one thing they did as well, in the sense of planning, take tons of beautiful pictures, right? There's this beautiful picture here at Mammoth Hot Springs. Do this, recreate this photo today, you'll be arrested. Please don't do it. <laughs> yeah. But we do know now today um, how dangerous this can be, but in the funness and kind of that experimentation, you see these photos exist. And in terms of planning, when you're trying for something new, big planning, if you notice one soldier in particular, this soldier right here, what do you notice that's on his bicycle? Yeah. Anyone see what's on, top, on the front of his bicycle? Yeah, like a box or something. That's right, it's a big box. So this man right here, his name is Private John Finley. Now John Finley was a very grateful recruit in terms of Lieutenant Moss's uh, bicycle corps because prior to joining the military, so prior to his enlistment and being assigned to 25th Infantry, Mr. Finley worked in Chicago at a bike shop. <laughs> so who knows how to fix bikes? Okay. And with this opportunity, again, think about that, that term that I was talking about before. We're talking about if this opportunity is a good one, in terms of Lieutenant James A. Moss, it's a great opportunity to show your leadership, to move up in rank, hopefully get a new assignment away from the 25th Infantry, if that is your thought process. But think of the soldiers doing common garrison work, day in and day out. Now there's an opportunity to take a bike ride. Sure, <laughs> here's an opportunity so you can use your skills. But how is that choice made? And you have an entire regiment of people there. They could pick anyone, right? It's a volunteer idea. But how do you stand up on that list? I've worked in a bike shop. Yeah. <laughs> I can fix bikes. So he gets assigned to be the, the mechanic for this group. And throughout the, throughout the journey, you know, give or take, 
he's sacrificing a lot because he's fixing these bikes at all times. You're not having these experienced athletic riders and easy fixed bikes like we have today. You deal with bicycles in these harder conditions. So, and you can see what they were dealing with. Rain, sleet, mud, <laughs> snow, carrying their bicycle and all their equipment and their full regiment of gear through the rain, the sleet, and the snow, and the water, right? And with that, as things are getting broken, who's repairing them? Private Finley. 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 When does he do it? Because he's there along with them. Yeah. What if he breaks his bike? He has to fix it too. If anyone breaks their bike, who's fixing it? He is. No one else really. So that's an added responsibility. You can imagine how hard that can be. Brings me to my next big question. What sacrifices have you seen others make for your benefit? Take like a second to reflect on that. What sacrifices have you seen others make for your benefit? Serving in the military. Mm, you, you took the easy answer. I was going to hit that path. But yes, of course. People serving over countries, serving, serving to protect your freedom, to protect you here. That's something that's easy, especially in the, in the place like this in this museum, to reflect on. Right? Anyone else? Yep. Giving up their careers for someone else's career. That's true. Yeah. Giving up your career so you can help someone else, right? To be there for a family member. Um, I know I've seen stories of family members or mothers and dads switch careers completely to be there for their kids. It's a huge sacrifice for their benefit so they can be there. Right? That's how I hand over here. Police and fire. Police and fire. That's right. Oh, my. Being in that forefront, right? That to sacrifice your safety to protect that child or protect that cat from a fire, like all these things in between. It's a huge sacrifice. And second part of this question, and as you see, we're getting deeper as we get to know each other, right? <laughs> second part of this question is, have you ever spoken to them about it? You know? Going back to the answer for the military, I'm grateful we have events like such as this today and museums such as this where we get to talk and honor these military history stories. But Think of their parents, the sacrifices they made, and even the brothers, sisters, community members, people you work with, how they stayed the extra shift so you could get home to be with your loved ones or to do an event that you wanted to do so you could make it to that baseball game. That simple thank you could go a long way, but also talking about what made you make that decision. And oftentimes it's for your benefit, right? Because then your benefit is my benefit, kind of goes back and forth. And in terms of Brian and John Finley, well, late nights, early rides. <laughs> He sacrificed a lot of his sleep during this time period. He would be there throughout the night fixing bicycles. Famously, in some of the journals, he's up until two, three in the morning before uh, everything's called for 5.30 for everyone to wake up and start making breakfast. He's not getting much sleep, but he's sacrificing that because he knows we want to accomplish this mission, right? At the same time, he's still a soldier in the military. He's being assigned something by his commanding officer. He's going to do to the best of his abilities so that the group can succeed. And with that, we have the new experiment, right? After that full summer of being to Lake McDonald in 1896, as well as the Yellowstone National Park, they have now proven that it's successful. But is it really? You've only kind of stayed in Montana, Wyoming, that came the same kind of environment. But as we see across the country, we have sand hills. We have places of alkali water. We have places that are deserts. We have places that have cobblestone. We have places that have lakes and rivers and different environments and different elevations than just that. So that's when Lieutenant James A. Moss proposes a larger experiment. And this experiment now <clears> takes <throat> us from Fort Missoula, Montana, all the way to St. Louis, Missouri. Now, can anyone show of hands who knows how far that is? That's right, it's a long distance. That's the easy answer. <laughs> In truth, the distance is about a little over 1,900 miles. So you're looking at about 2,000 miles from Fort Missoula, Montana to get to St. Louis, Missouri. While you're going through that journey, you're going across various states, you're going through various terrains, various elevations, up and downhill on a bicycle. You're gonna need more people. <laughs> and that's exactly what they do. If you see this picture here, they now increase from that group of about six or eight people all the way up to 20 soldiers, having a sergeant, two corporals, and the rest of them are privates, including Private John Finley, he's the mechanic. <laughs> and now you also incorporate as well a medic. So a medic officer who's with you as well, and Lieutenant James A. Moss at the helm. But they recruit one more person, that's why thankfully this photograph exists. They also recruit a reporter. Because what's better than doing the work and showing that you can be done and writing the report? Mm -hmm. Bringing along someone to write it down and that prove evidence, right? We have photographs of this time period. So we're having photographs taken. 
Um, and as they're making it all the way down to St. Louis, one person in particular who they bring is this man by the name of Sergeant Mingo Sanders. That's the gentleman that sits right here in the side. Now, Sergeant Mingo Sanders' story starts early off, about um, a couple decades, decades earlier when he does enlist in those original units, um, the Buffalo Soldier Regiments, and he serves um, as a soldier during the Plains War. He experiences the, the conflicts of war, but through that he's gained massive leadership. He rises to the rank of sergeant, and even during that time period, he even has um, a glass bottle explode and take out his eye. So he's missing an eye. Mm. But his leadership is bar none, top of the line on that infantry. So he nominates to go to kind of not only experience the countryside, but to help in assistance leading this larger group of men to succeed in their mission. And as they're going, you can imagine the sacrifices that they're making, right? And with Sergeant Mingo Sanders already having that experience beforehand, and now serving with oftentimes a lot of younger, younger troops, or younger people and younger soldiers, have you ever felt working, how have you felt working on a team with someone who's older than you? <laughs> mm, right? <laughs> Everybody's older than me. <laughs> Feels good, right? Yeah. The more experience, the more experience they know what they're doing, right? Huh? You listen to them. You listen to them, right? We respect the elders. That very young lesson we learned very early on, right? Right? And it kind of builds that camaraderie like he knows what he's talking about, right? And just for age sakes, Yes, Bingo Sanders is older than Lieutenant Moss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lieutenant Moss is still in charge. But there are times throughout this journey where people fall sick. Lieutenant Moss falls sick and actually stays behind about a day and a half in one of the cities they stop in. So who's in charge of the bicycle corps? Sergeant Bingo Sanders, mm -hmm. right? Um, in truth, yes, you know, by, by law, you know, by, by rank, it was the, the medic officer for sure. Who's truly leading these soldiers? Who's making sure they're getting their stuff together? Or who runs the army? The sergeants, right? The ones who are really pushing, making sure everything's getting done and accomplished. Making sure everyone's going to bed on time. Making sure everyone's bikes are up to par. Making sure Private Finley's doing okay and fixing all the bikes. <laughs> he has this huge push of leadership and pushes them to accomplish these missions. And as they're going through, they're reflecting on Sergeant Mingo Sanders. And even his colonel reflects it in his yearly report. A sergeant with character excellent and much desired by his company commander and myself. This is somebody who knows how to lead, but also inspires others to take charge and to make sure the tasks are accomplished, right? They, these are, this is, in a sense, a military experiment, right? It's a bicycle experiment, sure, and tested bicycles are better than horses, but better than horses in what format? Not just riding for fun, by performing military drills, by still waking up on time, by still performing these various tasks that the military will expect you to do while on, on assignment. And who's helping lead that charge? Sergeant Mingo Sanders. He knows these rules and regulations like the back of his hand, right? So as they're going through, they're seeing some sights along the way, right? They're traveling across the country. One of the first places they actually come across is um, one of the forts where they get a send off by the 10th Cavalry. As they're going through Montana, they stop at one of the forts to, you know, resupply, sleep, sleep in a bed. <laughs> but that fort was actually occupied by the 10th Cavalry. So these African-American soldiers are seeing these African-American soldiers on bicycles. They're on horses. So you're leading the way of the future. Imagine being the first person to, to work with cars, right? You're on the horses and you're working with someone who's gonna be leading the first car trip, or that first bus, that first tank, that first helicopter, all these various things. It builds you with an excitement and you're hoping them the best because in a sense they're changing the world for you, right? So they give them a huge send off. This is an actual photograph um, of them at that fort and that big send off. And as they're going through, they're building curiosity, right? How often times do you look out the window and you see beautiful cars all lined up, all passing at the same time? Like, what's going on out there? That curiosity by the community. They're passing through these established communities and they're getting interest. You see everyone kind of stopping and asking questions. And even the local photographers from those newspapers are taking photos, documenting that they're passing through, right? And they're building even connections and kind of curiosity from the local community. Also, too, talking about Custer earlier, you know, he, well, no, he met his demise at the Battle of Little Bighorn. They passed that on their way. And as most military people do as well, you want to honor those who come before, those who have been lost. They actually make a stop here and honor those who died, those soldiers who died. So part of their journey, they also kind of attribute to honoring the soldiers who, who served there before them. And as they continue through, they're passing, um, yep, that one, this one. 
They also pass them through national parks as well, right? Big old Devil's Tower in Wyoming as they're going through across the entire state. Granted, they saw them in the distance. They're a little closer than this photograph shows, but couldn't find, you know, couldn't find their photo that they took. But they're passing through these big, beautiful landscapes, right? And again, to see this countryside in a very different light. Because very differently going from fort to fort, from assignment to assignment. But now you're kind of doing more of an experiment. You're still doing the mission. But the concept of it is all to take in what you're seeing around you. How you see that? Huh? Now, as they arrived in St. Louis, they were met with great applause. You would actually have kind of this organization where the bicycle, remember those bicycle units in cities that were forming? They were excited the bicycle corps was coming through because they're adding to their motif. Like, yes, bicycles are great, they're cool. More recruits, more, more members, right? <laughs> but they meet them um, over in Nebraska as they're about to cross over into Missouri, right? And as they're going through, they're telling of their journey. The scars, the tears on their shirts, the tears on the bikes, it's all becoming more evident of how they traveled that 2,000 mile journey and how amazing it was. Anyone guesses how long it took them? About 2,000 miles. Three months? Three months, okay. It was about 90 days. Anyone else? Yeah, it's a hard guess, right? Truth is, it took them 41 days. 41. 41 days. That's how long it took them to go from Fort Missoula, Montana, all the way through all that chaos, rain, sleet, and snow, they experienced it all, I'll tell you. All the way to St. Louis, Missouri in 41 days. And as they arrived in St. Louis, the big city um, greeted them. The big city welcomed them in. There was a huge parade, huge um, reveal for them to, to come in. And also take the concept, the, 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 the reality of what the Buffalo soldiers, the African American soldiers are experiencing. When they are visiting towns, they're not always greeted with love and respect during this time period in the 1890s. And here's one of these big cities with open arms taking them in, doing a whole feast to welcome them, right? A whole parade, a whole ceremony to, that they accomplished their big mission. And not only for the city's sake, if the newspapers are reporting that they're coming to St. Louis, what, uh, what else is in the newspaper besides the Bison Corps? St. Louis. That camaraderie, people are coming to the city, people are going to come spend money, which is great. Businesses are going to boom, but now we also have this big push for bicycles. And where's the bike shop? In St. Louis, too. There's tons of them, right? <laughs> So you have this kind of growth. And while they arrive in St. Louis, they're also demonstrating their skills. Like yes, they're still doing drills, right? And one of the drills they did was performing wall jumps and how they would take not only themselves, but also the bicycles and all their equipment over the, over the walls. Can a horse jump over that wall? Yeah. Right? Like, no, but bicycles can. Because if you work together, there's different various ways. Kind of again, that cost benefit between bicycles and horses in that experiment. And they're showing this not only to the masses and the military people who were there in St. Louis, but they're showing it to the common person. Remember, these are our tax dollars, right? They're going to spend it on a horse, or should they spend it on the bike? We have that voice, right? And as they're going through this uh, newspaper here, um, I know it's a lot of reading. I won't expect you to read it all. I'll read it out loud. <laughs> um, but Sunday morning, St. Louis Post on July 25th, the day after they arrived, reads, um, and this is a report from Lieutenant James A. Moss. He stated, we endured every possible conditions of warfare, but being shot at. So this is an experiment, right? The trip has proved beyond per adventure my contention that the bicycle has a place in modern warfare in every kind of weather or all sorts of roads. We, are, we average 50 miles a day at the end of the journey. We are all in good physical condition. 17 tires and a half a dozen broken frames <laughs> is the sum of our damage. That's it. <laughs> the practical result of the trip shows that an army bicycle corps can travel twice as fast as a cavalry or infantry under any condition and at one third of the cost and effort. Oh, wow. That's his reporting. Who do you tell us to? To the newspaper, tell the world, right? It's yeah. yeah. Wow. And you can see the picture of their journey. This is an actual map of where they went from the top left, from Fort Missoula, Montana, all the way through, crossing through Wyoming, and the south, a little bit of South Dakota. Nebraska was the harsh one because you have the sand hills in Nebraska making it all the way to touching Kansas and making it through across the entirety of Missouri. They traveled just under 2,000 miles this journey and they did it successfully, all 20 of these men. But what's next? You have the successful experiment, you have the support of the crowds of St. Louis and across the country, these newspapers are screaming your name and how efficient you are. Next is the new experiments, right? Test it again, now let's try going to the Pacific, let's try different mountain ranges to really 
prove that these are more efficient and also now start putting in orders for bicycles instead of horses. But what happens in 1898, the very next year? Spanish-American War. Spanish-American War. Are we going to care about experiments when we're at war? Eh, probably not. It kind of falls to the wayside, right? So sadly, the bicycle port journey kind of ends, comes to a close in that chapter, right? So now we all focus all guns ho for the Spanish-American War. Many of those soldiers go off and fight in this war as well, including Sergeant uh, Mingo Sanders, um, including Lieutenant James A. Moss. They all are now serving in this war, in this conflict, to put that to an end. And even after that, what do you have next? The Philippine-American War. <laughs> so then you have that conflict now going across the country into the Philippines. And you have these different tropical now environments. Are bicycles necessary? Eh, probably not. Should we move that or move ammunition? Right, because this is not within our country. We have to move things, we have to be more efficient in what we're moving and kind of contemplate it that way. And then what's happening at the turn of the century in the 1900s? You have the invention of cars. Yeah. Imagine how better the environment could have been if we had bikes instead of cars. But who knows, right? But now we have this invention of, bicycle, of cars, easier to transport, easier to press the, press the pedal than to pedal your way through the mountains, right? <laughs> but now you have this kind of change and shift in what happens. But we still have the story of the bicycle port. These three experiments arise that were proved successful. Now, big question again, back to you all. What do you believe to be more important? The journey or the destination? The journey. The journey. journey. Anyone for destination? Oh, yeah. Yeah, get, get to the place. It's kind of both. Yeah, it's kind of both, mm -hmm. right? If you didn't have a destination, you wouldn't have a journey. Yeah. And let's think about it in terms of the bicycle port, because Lieutenant James A. Moss his destination was a promotion, kind of showing he had leadership, mission accomplished, and he did that through the journey, right? Even for the soldiers themselves, getting out of garrison life, which can, you know, fall to the wayside if we're doing the same thing, and it's tough. Here's an opportunity to cross, ride around the country and be celebrated across the country in these various towns and cities. That was a new experience. That journey may have been more crucial and important. Because in the destination, you know, you can go back to the garrison and back to work. But <laughs> you have these different mindsets of what's happening. And we can reflect on that as well as you're traveling around and traveling the countryside, coming to different events. How you get there, sure. Like, who's really contemplated how they got here today? But now we're here for this event, this destination, of how great it is, and vice versa. They kind of match in various ways. But what happens to the Vice Corps as well? We do want to honor the riders. And here are the names of those riders. Uh, Lieutenant James A. Moss and Dr. James M. Kennedy are the two officers who rode in this unit. Um, Eddie H. Booz, the reporter, who rode this entire long way with them, right? A young reporter from Montana. You have Sergeant Mingle Sanders at the helm and Corporal William J. Haynes as well as Corporal Abraham Martin. Um, and for the musician, Elias Johnson, because you know, they didn't have radios back then. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be entertained. He brought around his trumpet the entire journey. So imagine how happy or sad he may have been with the music. <laughs> but then you also have Privates Travis Bridges, Francis Button, John Cook, Hiram L.B. Dingman, John Finley, the mechanic, Elwood Foreman, Frank L. Johnson, Sam Johnson, yes, they were brothers, and then Eugene Jones, William Proctor, Samuel Reed, George Scott, Richard Rout, Sam Wilson, William Wilson, Williamson, both brothers again and John Wilson. You have this cadre of soldiers, and I think the great thing we do here at the Charles Jones Buffalo Soldiers National Monument, not only tell you the story, but with the research we do, we get to discover these names and learn their histories and kind of report on that as well. And another piece too with the 25th Infantry Bison Corps, though they may not have replaced horses, but they do give us a nice touch into history of how things could have been and the kind of the sacrifices they made for us to get to where we are today. And there's, through their service, we now have, oftentimes we go to these places like Yellowstone or even Grand Teton, and there's bikes, there's bike spaces there, right? We're trying to add even more bicycle-friendly places where pedestrians can enjoy and recreate. Maybe not through the woods in the, in the wilderness mm -hmm. like that, <laughs> but we still have this piece of the story that shows not only the sacrifice and um, the multitude that they went through, that these African-American soldiers did in this, in this regiment, but the 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps sacrificed so much so we can see what the other side could look like. Though technology moved way past what they were wanted, we still have their story to, um, to know, but also to, to share in this kind of culmination that was the experience of these African-American soldiers at this time. And with that, I bring my presentation to a close. And of course, in that old presentation, they always end with questions, so I'm always here for you. <laughs> yeah.
All righty. That was fantastic. Yeah, yeah a lot of information, but a lot of cool fantastic. stuff. Fantastic. <laughs> and on the table, here is, gosh, this is awesome. Uh, I'll get it open. There it is. Charles Young and the Buffalo Soldiers. This is fantastic. Yep. If you want to know anything, National Park Rangers. Okay. So we're going to do a little business here. All right. Okay. No problem. Please. But anyway, I'll throw stuff right here to the side. So we need to go over this way a little bit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. show our appreciation. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Miami Valley Military History Museum Certificate of Appreciation. To all who shall see these presents, greetings. The certificate is awarded to Roger Osario in recognition of his support of our program and his continued dedication, commitment, and support to the ideals of patriotism in this 26th day of April in the year 2023. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> we always like to give our speakers gifts. And Barbara, our librarian, found. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. That is huge. Yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. She finds stuff down in all of her thousands of books downstairs. This is about, thank you so much. This is huge. Huge yeah. <laughs> piece uh, of research. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Business. Uh, We're busy. I'll be standing right over here, but I'll be continuing on. Cool. And no worries. Enjoy, enjoy. Thank you all. <laughs> so Roger has all kinds of goodies over here. Um, he has the um, passes to the national parks um, and some really cool goodies. Um, let's see. What's in your program? Our first, our first professional brochure. And yes, there are all things that need adjusted, but this is cool. Your flyer to the military history master. This year we will be in Calamityville as the city is repaving community parks, parking lot. More information on the National Park Service and where you can go to find that. Our speaker series. Yeah, let's see. Up next is a Jim Brokaw, United States Navy retired submariner. He's going to speak on his submarine life. So that's going to be really, really good. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, Barb. Okay, a little change in the subject. Uh, on Friday night, the Hall of Fairborn High School, Fairborn City Schools Hall of Honor is going to be at 7 o'clock in the high school auditorium. Everyone is welcome. Um, we have uh, Colonel Tuck Thornberry, John Oakley, Steve Edwards, Sergeant Hazley, Sean Kelly, Ed Gibbons, some of you I'm sure remember from the school, and Wendy Kirsch. Um, I have two of my, Norma Nicola and one Brown on past and findings, and I hope that you all should come and join us. Fantastic. Thank that you. is going to be an awesome program. She is edited printer, edited printer. She's been doing this, I think, for a year, easily enough. Um, uh, uh, the channel two is. We're going to be on the 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock news hours. So I'm going to try and stay away. I'm not going to know a lot of luck. But Dan, do you have any? Yes. Yes. Do you have any? Okay. Um, Mark? Nope. Okay. And um, Roger? Yep. Oh, shoot. Not you. <laughs> Bob Simple. Yes, ma'am. Do you have anything you would like to say? He is where we got the aircraft from. I'm uh, Bob Stemple, the retired Air Force crew chief on the 141s and 130s. In the Park Service, I told him up front I wasn't politically correct that they hired me anyway. <laughs> so I am retiring very shortly. Um, so some of the stuff that was brought in here, stuff out of my office at the Rock Raiders uh, bicycle shop downtown. So 
We have four national park sites down here in Southern Ohio. The uh, Charles Young Buffalo Soldiers, uh, Dayton Aviation Heritage National Historic Park, Wright Brothers Museum, uh, Hopewell Culture, uh, out at uh, Chillicothe, and the Taft House down in Cincinnati. So all four sites are free. Uh, they're open to the public all the time. Yes, sir. Where is the Buffalo Soldiers? The memorial or the house? The house is out on uh, Route 42, right outside of Xenia, going right into um, Wilberforce. Right now, the house is being restored, and that's my last job before I retire, so that's to get it up and, and to that point where they can take it over. Um, so it's going to be open up to the public sometime in August. We're looking at that time frame, yeah, because then construction should be, you know, Bob knows more about the construction, but that should be wrapping up about Memorial Day around that time frame. We still got to get all the furniture and exhibits back. So, so give us some time on that. But we're, now we're looking at like probably a, towards the end of August, rather yep. than late summer, we'll be reopened to the public. So there'll be a there'll be something out in the newspaper first on that. So come out and see it when it's opened back up. It's, it's a complete restoration of the house, taking it back to the days that uh, Young was in, that lived in there. So some of the stuff was damaged. The house was damaged in the 74 Xenia tornado. Uh, the barn's not going to be rebuilt this time around, but the house has been it's being restored back prior to uh, the damage and stuff. So. Uh, thanks to Barb and Jody for setting up our refreshments table. So you have to have something off of there, or they're both going to feel really bad. <laughs> and one other thing <clears throat> sponsor a piece of history. We're poor. I need your money uh, so we can continue these programs and our military history muster. Um, so what we've done is taken and, yep, there we go. There it is. Uh, all right, Kathy, look at that. <laughs> all right, so the bottom is perforated. So you can fill this out. In fact, we have some over there. Jody's manning that table. And we have the self-addressed stamped envelopes to go with you. And just give me a lot of money. I really need it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is it. Thank you yeah. for the, oh my gosh, yeah. incredible <laughs> I'll still be here taking it for a little bit, but if you are a veteran, all I would need to see is your ID. We do have these lifetime passes. We will get you into every national park, every national forest. Anything we have to pay gets you and your car for free. Um, all I need to see is some ID that says you're a veteran, mm -hmm. and then this is yours for a lifetime. I know for any, if there are any active duty, um, we still have to see active duty. We have a different path for you as well. Um, but again, today is, um, we are part of National Park Week as well this week. And we do want to show gratitude, again, that sense of saying thank you in a sense. Um, this is what we would like to do that as a, with the Park Service. So feel free to come by this table. We have these all set up as well. Um, but yeah, thank you once again for attending this program. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.